Dr. Blumenthal, <laughs> Dara, thank you so much for, for having me at your, at your home today. Yeah. I'm Thanks excited. For being here. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of want to start out with just a little bit about your bio, which I stole off of LinkedIn. Okay. Um, but I think it gives kind of a good um, foundation for what we're going to be talking about and your experience and how you can kind of help um, the audience navigate some of the conversations we're going to have today. Okay. Um, so you are a sociologist, a developmental coach, integral facilitator, a cultural theorist, mon- a mind body awareness practitioner, Reiki master, <laughs> and organizational designer. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of things. A lot of things. Um, yeah. But you're you're pulling from um, multiple disciplines, um, multiple areas, with the goal of being committed to helping people and teams expand who they are and what they can achieve. Yep. So that's pretty lofty at at a high level. Um, And I think that I kind of want to take that in a couple of different directions today. I want to talk about kind of the, the individual and what individuals can do to better themselves, to better navigate um, transitionary points in their life. But then I also want to talk about the individual in context of working with a team mm-hmm. or um, the or just being in a team and, and how teams can can like better work together. Because I know that's a, a lot of the work that you do. Uh, but how did you kind of become get on this on this path of being interested in psychology and philosophy and, and all of the rest all of all of these multiple things on your LinkedIn yeah profile. uh that's a good question uh so I've I've had the the great fortune that my parents didn't really have a plan for me or um or many ideas of how I should live my life so the the very short answer is that I've just always followed what has earnestly interested me and it's taken me in multiple directions um but in like you said like I'm an interdisciplinary at heart like and my I have a degree to prove it right like my undergrad is it I think it actually says interdisciplinary major or something or concentration that's what the school I went to was um But yeah, I've just, for whatever reason, I've always been interested in sort of the human condition and and who we are and and how we live our lives. I don't know. That's, that's, uh, I mean, that could get philosophical real quick. It can definitely get philosophical real quick. I I think the the first thing that that sticks out is that um, your parents actually allowed you to kind of pursue this path. And it's interesting because there's a lot of individuals that become interested in this type of thing because of kind of an opposite reaction. Um, how can uh, parents allow their children to better cultivate an interest in psychology and, and philosophy and ensure that maybe even if that's not the interest that children takes, that they're allowing their children to, to be free to express themselves? Well, it, you know, take it with a grain of salt assault because I'm not a parent right (laughs) but the advice that I would have for anyone who wants to sort of liberate anyone else in their care is to is to liberate themselves Mm. so the more work that parents can do in sort of showing up for themselves and sort of cleaning up their own minds they're going to create more spaciousness and more freedom for their children to do the same and even if that isn't always possible, like there's definitely like m- mental illness in, in my family. Um, but I was always given the space to be whoever and whatever I wanted to be. Right. So so there I think, you know, a lot of parenting today, it's like there's this fusion. This like it's like being confused, like you're the parent is fused with the child. And sure. we see this in our teams, too. There's a fusion of whatever's going on in one person's mind as it's played out in the team, which is why, I mean, this is like a tangent kind of, but when you do organizational work, it's so important to start at the top because whatever is happening in the top team is what is going to happen lower and lower and lower. And it's sort of the same in the family, like whatever is happening in the par- the parental dynamic or even the parent with the self. Right. It's going to bleed out. So 
um, there is this piece around boundaries of self and also just understanding sort of where you end and someone else begins. But that conversation too can be taken in many ways. It can definitely be taken in, in many ways. Um, one way that, that I kind of initially think about it and before we were co- recording, um, I was just talking about the fact that like I got out of a relationship and this was the first serious relationship that I had that we talked about longer term goals. Um, and I realized that when you're in a serious relationship or even when you're, when you're in a, a business, there are um, kind of shared goals. Uh, there's kind of a communication on what can we achieve together but then sometimes when you're taken out of that situation you might actually think to yourself was that really the goal that I was working for or was I giving too much of myself um, or was I was I not really be auth- being authentically who I want who I am because I wanted to make that other person happy yeah it's a great question yeah and I can speak to it from a developmental perspective cool so um when I say development, I'm talking about adult developmental psychology. And this is a, a body of knowledge and research and, and sort of methods for uh, developing an adulthood. It also is related to integral. So you mentioned earlier that I'm an integral facilitator. Right. So these, these um, schools of thought come together often. And what happens, I think the statistic is like, I think it's like 58% of adults in our society don't ever really make it past um, this socialized mind stage of development. And and what's really um, powerful about about this this moment of development is that you're actually you're made up by your relationships. So which is on the one hand, it's incredibly beautiful to have yourself sort of enmeshed and made up by the relationships that you're in and the context sure. that you're a part of, you can also see that it's hard to, I mean, in, in a realistic sense, it's impossible to get uh, like a distance, to get like an objective view on that while it's happening. And that, that would be described as the socialized mind stage of development. Um, does that mean that individuals that maybe experience some childhood trauma find it more difficult to leave that socialized stage that's a good question um and i'll just also say that the i'm this is keegan's model robert keegan's model so that's what that that terminology come fr- comes from cool trauma it's a it's a great question i don't feel super informed to really speak about trauma um on development just because it's it's not my my area um but so much that happens in childhood and in the that that parental relationship and especially the primary caregiver relationship it has huge impacts on on adulthood and how you develop and what you can really do with your life um i've been reading uh about there's a there's a methodology uh a modality that i think is really powerful that's called hakomi which is a somatic psychotherapy uh, modality and I was read. I was just, I'm just reading this book. I don't know. It's somewhere over there, which is why I'm gesturing <laughs> that way, right? Over there. <laughs> um, and I was reading yesterday that that like it was something to the effect of that the child creates the map, hmm. and that map is what the the adult continues to use to navigate life. And until you really start to turn towards and work with your child that's the map right in those in those early years uh that are so important to the rest of your life you're creating a a map of your life of of your basically you're creating your operating system for me experiencing some childhood trauma uh, my parents got divorced had fam like history of depression in my family. Um, I realized that I had to take added measures to actually be able to not compensate for that, but to be able to actually handle that. And I think that for people that are dealing with um, certain behavioral disorders or anxiety or depression, whatever it may be, uh, 
at least for me, when I was younger, there was this sense that I was looking at other people that seemed to be happy. Um, and I was like, why do I not feel this way? Or why do I have to take added steps? Um, but then once I started taking those steps, I realized that they were super beneficial to me, mm -hmm. meditation being one. So I guess the, the, the point that I'm making there is that some people think, why do I need to meditate? Um, other people don't meditate and they seem fine. For me, that I realized that like admitting is the first step that, that you have a problem, that you have an issue that you want to work through. And then cultivating those practices is super helpful for that. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, the thing that just strikes me so much listening to you talking about this thing in particular is that it's a gift right? to sort of wake up to your own suffering, to wake up to your pain. It's a gift because it can lead you in so many directions. And really, this is sort of like the expansion that I'm interested in. You know, people who, who are perfectly content, they might not ever need to expand, you know? Right. And it's never presented to them. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's never, it's never presented to them in that way. And, and now it's kind of like when you, when you start that path of, of expansion, then you, you kind of realize there's a baseline and then I can actually increase that, that baseline through these specific practices. Mm. Um, I wrote a couple of things, uh, again, based on, on the work that you do. Uh, and I wanted to specifically talk about a few of them, but to start, um, you talk about embracing a new level of reality to more readily find flow. And I'm assuming that you mean the concept of a flow, uh, the psychologist Mihaly, long Russian last name that I cannot <laughs> pronounce. I think that finding flow in your life is extremely important. And I think that it's one of those things that you can specifically find in, in the work that you do. So when you talk about this type of work um, and you're working with organizations, how do you kind of go about allowing individuals to find more flow in their life? Yeah, great question. So a couple of things. Flow, which is really like, I just use that word because it's sort of a buzzword. Yeah, it's and, such a buzzword. Right, people are like, oh, flow. <laughs> flow. But really like, what is flow? Flow is a state, it's a state experience where there is really egolessness. So you're not experiencing the ego as directing the activity. It's, and you can also experience sort of a timelessness, right? You can lose track of time. Um, and there might be other markers, but I think those are the two really, really important ones. So when you're in a flow state, mm -hmm. there is the ego isn't driving the ship. And then you, you enter into this experience where you, you actually don't, you're not bound by time. Uh, elaborate on that. Yeah. So when we're, when we're more in our ego, how are we more bounded by time as a result? Well, you might be like, what time is it? I have so much to do. There's this right. list. I have to go do this. Yeah. Everyone's going so slow. Why can't you walk up the subway stairs? <laughs> you know, like, like you're just in this, like, the experience is that you're, you're confined by, especially as New Yorkers, like how much you can accomplish in a day. Right. And when you're in a flow state, you actually, like, it's just not in your awareness at all. Like your awareness has expanded such that it's just not a factor. You might like be like, you might wake up from a flow state sort of and say, oh, I'm starving. I haven't eaten lunch. Lunch was like three hours ago. Right. You know? Right. So, um, so that, that's like just how I would characterize like the flow, like that state, that state experience. And it's, it's beautiful. You're sort of elaborating it to like what in your life, it can be something that is present when you're sort of just flowing with what's emerging. Um, so, I'm really, really, I'm super interested in the micro, in like the everyday experience. Yeah. And how, how sort of that sort of finding that state experience can inspire you to really invite that into sort of the, the wider view of how you're living your life and your lifestyle. Um, so what are some kind of practical ways to go about that? Because I think that for a lot of people that may be listening to this, that um, work in, in, primarily kind of online doing online work uh you know 
20 tabs open at your on your screen at any one time. Uh, you're constantly getting text messages, Slack notifications, emails, right? Everyone's bombarding you with your time. Um, how can we like operate within that environment and cultivate that flow? Yeah. Um, and also, let me just say that Please. like binge watching Game of Thrones or whatever it is. Everyone's doing that. Right. right that's now. not flow. You're numbing out. That's really different. Right. Sure. OK. So so it's it's like you might <laughs> you forgot where you were. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah. God, what day is it? <laughs> um, so so the 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 experience of, of absorption is different right the energetic of it is different so my advice would be here's here's a few things you asked for practical advice yeah um okay the most practical practical thing i can say is block time on your calendar but really it's about having boundaries, having really good boundaries, having a really clear yes and a really clear no in yourself. Mm -hmm. And and the ultimate sort of yes is like, what are you alive for? Like what literally makes you come alive and just go towards that in your life? Because you're going to die. Sure. We like to like I like um, a Buddhist teacher, uh, Chogyam Trumpa. He likes to say that we're embarrassed by our death. It's an embarrassment in our society and we never talk about it. An embarrassment. Yeah, it's like, ooh, don't talk about that, right? It's taboo. Right. So what, what you know, and this is something I, that I work with clients around is like, where is the life force? Like, where are you actually alive? Yeah. And stop wasting your life. Yeah. You know, I've been into countless, I've like worked across the Fortune 500. I've been in countless organizations and corporations where there's just no energy. It's it's dead. People mm -hmm. are like dying and you can feel it. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. I, I was telling you when we when we first spoke, I've worked for, for a number of startups and um, there is that that feeling of there's that lack of, of energy um so for people that are working in fortune 500s right very large corporations i think that sometimes we can get a little bit philosophical and say i really need to find the the meaning of of my my life am i really helping people impacting people um if you're working at a corporation and you don't necessarily feel how can you how can you embody that when the corporation corporation's mission is so out there and maybe you're it's not actually authentically you um i guess the question is if we're if we're operating in these in these large companies where we don't feel like we're making an impact how can we still make an impact I, and feel a sense of fulfillment when it's like okay i'm i'm working for i don't know macy's and it's like i don't really I don't feel that that fulfillment from that job as much, but maybe I can find it in a different way. Yeah. So um, I'm going to echo myself a little bit from what I said earlier. Sure. So this this the the practice of generating intimacy with yourself, mm. becoming intimate with your own experience, and understanding where, like, literally, what makes you feel alive. That I would just, I, that's like sort of step one and you can spend years in that practice. Right. So even if you're, you know, you have an, you have a great job, you have a career, you know, you're a bit, you're part of a big organization and let's just say it's incredible that organizations can sustain for years and years and years, decades and can employ so many people like that's, that's sort of radical, right? Sure. Um, and, and that's like sort of what society should do. It's unfortunate that people, in order to sort of function in those environments, have had to like narrow, narrow, narrow themselves so much. So it's like, well, I'll just say this thing that I've thought about, which is like, you know how like in organizations, people are like, everything's so siloed, you know, yeah. we don't know what's going on. The truth is, is that for many people, it's not just that, 
the team is siloed. It's like the whole life experience is one of silos. So it's like, this is how I show up at work. This is how I show up as a parent. I get in my car, I drive to work, right? It's, it is, it is sort of germane to that, to that lifestyle. So the invitation is to invite the intimacy with your own experience, which, you know, in some ways very fundamentally means directly experiencing your body throughout the day. You know, this is why in part meditation is so mainstream. Mindfulness is so mainstream. So we've been cut off from our bodies for so long. And I, I love the idea that the body is the unconscious Mm. And you can only stuff down so much unconscious material until it starts to really impact you. So the invitation is to f show up for yourself first and foremost in the ways that you feel expanded and just see what happens. You know, again, to, to quote Cho Yam Trumpa, um, I think he says this, that, and this is me quoting Diane Musho Hamilton, who's a teacher of mine, uh, be yourself, the world will give you feedback. Right. Um, what do we do when that feedback isn't the best? Well, you have to discern, again, understanding if the, you know, there, there is sort of this difference, right, between operating from your ego and then actually operating from an intimacy of your experience. Mm -hmm. And you want to discern is the feedback actually like under all of the ego strategy to maintain status quo is it something that you actually should take in or is it something that isn't actually serving you and if it doesn't feel right and if it isn't serving you i would say to whatever extent you can change your context right um it's it's powerful stuff for sure yeah and um for for me specifically i've kind of i've been in this place where um i think that if i'm operating from a very egoic perspective it's easy to get brainwashed um and it's more difficult to take a step back and i also really like what you were saying kind of where we're, we're living by a to-do list for, for a lot of our life. The challenge is how do we cultivate mindfulness while also taking care of those daily obligations? How do we make that to-do list but don't feel overly attached to it? Um, attachment is something that I'm thinking about more and more, especially since getting out, like being out of this relationship. It's like, how can we operate in the world? How can we operate in our relationships and, and embody that and love fully and deeply while also not being attached? Yeah, I mean, that's right. This is, this is, the, this is like a koan. This is like a real challenging question um, for humanity, for what it means to be a person in the world. Um, you know... I'm, I'm probably going to answer this a couple different ways. So, I, you know, attachment is this thing that is sort of going mainstream. Mm. And you're talking about slightly about a different type of attachment. But um, I think they're really, really deeply related. So there's this, um, I don't know. I mean, you tell me if it's something you experience in your circles. But people are like, what is your attachment style? Yeah, yeah right? attachment this whole thing. theory, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so, so my, my Buddhist teacher and, um, and his teacher, uh, the, the lineage holder of, of the tradition that I practice in, um, they're attachment psychologists. So there's a lot, um, in my spiritual practice that is related to, to psychology and particularly, um, work around attachment. So it's totally possible to heal your attachment relationships, your attachment structure, maybe what you, you didn't get or, or weren't able to take in as an infant, as a child. Right. Um, so that's a very real thing that, that certain types of med meditation or visualization practices can help you with. Um, and so there's a corollary between 
the our sort of attachment style or our attachment disturbances from childhood and the way that we attach to things in adulthood we attach to getting stuff done we attach to people we attach to ideas mm-hmm. um so you know a, a great and i sort of forget the question but i'm just going to speak to what i think you asked me go for it which is you know <laughs> it, it's it's if we can begin to understand how attachment shows up in our experience, it feels different in the body. Like, let's just start there. The, when you're attaching to something, it mm. feels grippy. It, yeah. feel, it doesn't feel good, you know? Yeah, no. <laughs> it, right? Like, right. you tell me, how's it feel? Um, no, I mean, so I, like, I, I can speak from, from personal experience. Like, I think, again, coming from a coming from parents being divorced and kind of growing up where parents are, you know, my mom's one type of way, my dad's one type of way. They uh, like a lot of difficulty (laughs) there. Right. Um, But I realized um, when I've kind of come into, into relationships, like uh, there is that, that attachment. And I had like issues developing trust, developing just like, just like unguarded, um, trust and when it would show up because I've kind of practiced meditation I would feel that in my body I would feel that in kind of like in that tension um, and then you start telling your stories of like where is she what is she doing and and when you're going through that process you know that it's irrational but it's hard to kind of shake off as well yeah yeah totally yeah. So, so I think this is really um, a perfect segue or a perfect opportunity to say that, um, well, like just, okay, so this is the thing I want to say. The thing I want to say is that a lot of people are using meditation, using mindfulness practice to relax. Yeah. And that's great. Okay, relax. But like, why? In service of what, right? So meditation isn't, I'm just going to say this really bluntly, it's not about (laughs) relaxation. Right. It's not about relaxing. It's about waking up. So thinking about how you can actually use a tool like meditation to become aware of the attachment sort of relationship or experiencing showing up in your system while it's happening, and then you can actually make an active choice about what you want to do about it. Sometimes it's not hot, it's not so easy and you can't make that choice. Mm-hmm. But like that like that's one of the examples of what meditation can actually do for people. You can actually wake up to your own behavior in a way that is so intimate and undeniable if you actually start to turn your attention into yourself and into your experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh it, it's because again, a lot of people will become and I became interested in meditation because I tried to start a company when I, after graduating school and I was re- reading habits of successful entrepreneurs, meditation, meditate, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to meditate so I can be more focused, be more calm, get m- more stuff done, make more money. Great. Right. And then you kind of go into it and then it opens up your, your mind to the reality that meditation is more than just a tool to increase your focus. It's a tool to increase your awareness of who you really are. Um, and I guess there's a certain acceptance there too, right? Mm. And people might be at different stages in their kind of contemplative practice as well. Um, maybe for people that are listening to this that haven't meditated um, a lot, they might be kind of intimidated to hear that it's waking up. But what would you say to, to some of those people that are just kind of interested in, in getting started? I think if you're interested, you should do it. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you're if and if you're intimidated by waking up, (laughs) then you should do it. (laughs) You should meditate. You should try it if you're interested. Um, Yeah. You know, we're super uptight. Like yeah. we're, we're super uptight and we're, um, we're so disconnected from the body and it's a tragedy because 
to really be fulfilled, to really feel liberated and free. It's about your ability to direct your attention and to experience yourself. And like we're literally not experiencing our lives if we're disconnected from our bodies in this way. So, I mean, if you want to just like actually feel what it feels like to be alive, then it's worth a shot. What is the role that modern organizations and social media plays in this? And I know that's a very deep question, but this is the reason, the reason that I think that for me, I can actually, that these type of careers and this type of thing is going to be in much more demand. And the reason that meditation is on the rise is that you have this dichotomy of people becoming very anxious due to social media and what it's doing to our brains and then people becoming more interested in meditation. I don't know if yeah. there was a question there. Yeah, well, um, but <laughs> it's a great prompt. It's a great prompt. Let's see where we can go. Um, well, you know, you, there is this sort of like, uh, like something's happening, right? Like there, there is, there is something happening where, you, you know, first, first it was sort of like yoga. Like I remember, um, I mean, like even just taking New York City, like yoga was not what it is now, even 10 years ago. Right. You know, 15, 10 or 15 years ago, there were maybe a couple studios. No one played music. It was, you know, it was like a very quiet, serious sort of experience. It's totally different now, right? So there's yoga, there's like juicing and and intermittent fasting and like, right, everyone <laughs> is sort of like discovering these things and, um, you know, and then, then, then mindfulness has exploded and now mindfulness is leading people into actually like uh, trying to get what meditation is. Right. Right. So there is, there is like a wave, right? There's something happening, right? There's something building, growing, I would say. Um, do you have something you want to say? No. Um, okay. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> so, so there, there is this thing and, and part of it, um, one of the ways that I've thought and talked about it in the past is that there is sort of this move away from expertism where, where people are sort of administer like doctors, for example, are administering our lives, our health and our wellness to us in the same way as they were, you know, 20 years ago. Right. Right. So there's this reorientation to like our own experience that's that's starting to happen. And um, and it has a lot of implications. And so there, you know, and like the millennial generation, which like people really like to rag on. But it's sort of phenomenal what's happening with this generation and how they're showing up inside of organizations because um, they can't be ignored. Right. And and it is sort of this whole like this is the milieu that I just described that they've grown up in. And now that's sort of they they demand or they you know, I'm just generalizing this whole thing, whatever. Forgive me for that. But, you know, there there is a new demand that's being placed inside of teams and inside of organizations for how people can be expected to show up a new level of accountability, mm. um, a desire for, you know, this this sense of wholeness um, and, and purpose to show up. So, so that's happening. Um, and I think it's a good thing. And, and, you know, politically, a lot of stuff is sort of getting shaken out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we have to start to address things and look at things and have conversations that, um, that have, that we haven't been having. And especially, you know, I'm not, I'm really not into politics. I don't read the news. Like, if stuff is happening, it gets to me. Right. Um, but the one thing I will say is that, you know, sort of everyone needs to like level up in politically, right? Like the liberals are not talking to each other. They're not really having the conversations. Mm -hmm. So, um, so like you said earlier, like there is this like new level of reality that some people are starting to embrace and starting to demand. And um, the more real, honest conversations that we can have with each other, 
and and actually learning the art of that is is you know for the better and like the, i'll just do like a small plug for myself which is that plug, plug away. this is my plug is that i uh you know the, i sort of i when i work with teams it's sort of industry agnostic because i go in and i say i'm not here to like tell you how to run your business or what your strategy should be or anything like that i'm just here to help you have a better i.e more real more honest more vulnerable and more raw conversation that's going to free up a ton of energy in your in your system to actually do meaningful work and to do better work. Do you think there's been more demand for that type of work in the past five to ten years since you've actually started becoming interested in this? Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's it's crazy where we're kind of like cutting through the bullshit in a sense. Um, and because we have so much we have this like open source of information we're not just going to a doctor like we were 30 years ago, getting a prescription and just believing what they say. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, our demons and the harsh realities of our society are coming up in the political sphere. Uh, there's a, a great um, conversation online on YouTube that uh, Jay-Z had um, with this reporter, I think from the Wall Street Journal, um, and he was talking about kind of like racism in America and Trump. And he was talking about the fact that almost in a sense that this needed to happen, that we had to be awoken. So you talk about meditation kind of waking us up in a sense. It's kind of like the current um, social media landscape because there's so much transparency now is waking us up in a sense. Yeah, I, th I think that's and that's the potential of social media and that's the potential of AI is that it can actually be in service to to us waking up. Right. Yeah. And hopefully we we kind of move forward in, in a more positive light. What is your hypothesis on that? So because do you um, do you think that these this data on like younger kids being more stressed than ever before? Do you think that's because it's being reported now or do you actually think that social media is like leading to that? That's a good question. Um, well, I think, I think children probably are more stressed now because the level of, Honestly, like if we just get really, really honest, yeah, like we don't know what's going on, right? Like someone said to me the other day, like about like a realization they were having at work. They were like, oh, actually, like no one really knows what they're doing and everyone's just making it up all the time. And I would say, yes, that's true. Right. Like really, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. And um, and that means we're living in uncertainty all the time, not to mention like everything that's happening Globally, politically, climate, all of that tragic stuff, right? Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty. Our, our world is moving faster. The way that we live our lives are faster and faster and faster than ever before. Right. Like I can literally order something, sit on my sofa, order something from Amazon, and it can show up here even later today, let alone tomorrow. Like, like our lives have just sped up. Right. And we're, we're always on. We're always connected. And so, yeah, I think it's more stressful to be alive right now than it was. I mean, the stresses are different, but they're coming like fast and hot all the time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, uh, and as, as young kids growing up, um, there, like, there hasn't been enough research from an evolutionary perspective on the impact that social media is having on their development. Yeah, totally. Let yeah. alone just like having screens around all, all the, time, the time, yeah. you know, so totally. And, and, you know, like, I, like think about being in high school and like you shared with me your age a little while ago. So sure. I have a sense of like how old you were in high school. Right. And when like things happened. 2004 to 2008. Okay, great. So, Context. um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. So it's like, so 2004 to 2008. Right. So. Okay, so maybe I'll use me. I'll use me as an example. Go I'm ahead. a little bit older. <laughs> um, right, so my experience in high school, like, like AOL just came out. Like, dial-up internet was the thing. Maybe this was the same for you, too. I don't know. 
I was doing, oh, yeah, I yeah, 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 right. So, like, it wasn't, like, pictures and, and like, videos and, like, live stream of your life, right? So, if you were sharing anything online, it was, like, with some people, maybe you didn't know them. Maybe it was, like, maybe it was, like, some people you went to school with, but, like, that's a little funny. And... And so, like, whatever you were experiencing and all, like, the, the awkwardness and the fumbling of adolescence wasn't being shared potentially with the world or even the whole school. It was just being shared sort of with, like, your circle. Right. Right. So imagine that experience of, like, the awkwardness of growing up and, it, and the, the, the feeling that it could be shared with the whole world and you could never get rid of it. It's stressful it's to so think stressful, about. It's so stressful, right? It's just yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, I, I think about that too. Like, there's there might be parents listening to this, and th- or early parents. My one of my best friends um, just had had a little baby recently. Oh, the most adorable thing, little baby <laughs> Mila. Shout out to Mila. Uh, and yeah, she is going to be. I mean, it, who knows in five years what it's going to look like. But again, I want to kind of look at it from a positive perspective of the fact that now these conversations are happening more and more yeah. and there's more awareness of things like meditation. The difficulty, I think, is removing the dogma of the religious context for people that might just be looking at it from a more practical practical perspective. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, what your experience of like you say the religious dogma is yeah so um like what what's turned you off or uh i don't think it's turned me off as well as much i've i've read the bhagavad gita um dhammapada a little bit i think that buddhism is a little bit more accessible um you know i think it's just contextualizing the fact that some of these ancient texts were written in a different um time and we haven't been able to and and we have a very western mind of looking from everything from a a, a scientific lens yeah uh so there's things that are more difficult for me to comprehend like i was raised uh like christian more difficult for me to comprehend these stories in the bible as real instead of allegorical um so that's why i think it gets a little bit more difficult it's like how do you if you were raised christian or jewish or um how do you get involved in buddhist meditation and for me it came from experiencing it so experiencing the changes in my life but then also reading so much about the science and the data behind it cool okay um well i'm not a religious scholar by any means but what i can offer is that really all all religious traditions at one point or the or another had sort of a meditative or contemplative element right and a lot of it has fallen by the wayside um yeah i'll leave it at that i mean like a lot of people recently have been talking about christian mysticism okay (laughs) (laughs) which i'm like whoa okay so yeah so um the religious dogma well you know there there is a whole discussion and conversation about is buddhism a religion or is it a philosophy and really i mean there are a hundred thousand volumes written of of buddhism like what buddhism is and so you're never going to read them all and uh, and and really the sort of fundamental thing that i want to say if you're interested in Buddhism and, and really like any, you know, Buddhism or Kundalini or, um, I don't know, whatever, like, you know, shamanism, like whatever it might be, you know, Christianity, whatever it is, you want to have a real teacher. You want to have someone who is a, a teacher who is like a spiritual friend that you can talk to the most important thing and i will just speak from my perspective as as someone who who practices buddhism is that you you need a teacher and so it's and it's great to like inform yourself and to read stuff um but it's 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 just nowhere near actually working with someone who has and let's let's just say meditation and what you can do with meditation is that you can fundamentally change your basis of operation 
sort of mentally and in your nervous system so that you're not operating all the time from the ego mind, which is what we do a lot in society because that's sort of how we've constructed our version of self right. in the contemporary West. So what you can do is you can, you can just fundamentally shift your basis of operation. And that's something you can do through meditation. And to really do that, you need a teacher. You need a good teacher, a teacher who has, who has, a, who has attainment, who has you know experienced these things, and who is trustworthy and reliable, and um, yeah, like it, it should just feel really good to be with that person. It's um, it's difficult because a lot of people get interested in this stuff by seeing like an ad to download Headspace, and then, <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, yeah, do a little bit of meditation that way. Um, I'm, and that and that's great. Like that's let's just say sure. like that's awesome. Do that. And if you want to go deeper and if you want to go further, find a teacher. And I and I think I'm I'm reminded of this quote by a Wayne Dy- Dyer 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 uh, yeah. Dyer. Um, I think it was him that said, uh, "Don't um, don't be uh, don't be Buddhist. Be Buddha like. Don't be Christian. Be Christ like." Yeah. Um, basically, try to embody the operating system that they were living under, which was one of compassion and, and love at its core. Um, and can I just add to that? Please. Even better, or I'm just going to add to it, but I think <laughs> this is, this is, so this is something I love this, this quote, this teaching Yeah. is, um, don't be a Buddha. I mean, yeah, don't be a Buddhist, be a Buddha, mm. right? Which is sort of what you're saying. Yeah. And, and even further still is, Buddha is trying to become me. So instead of me trying to act like or, or be like, right, Buddha, the sense that it's actually like coming from within, right? It's, it's like an inside out transformation. It's not an act. And it's a continuous practice. And especially for kids, it's so easy to... I think certain personalities or certain individuals are more prone to this. So easy to become interested in what someone else is doing and then kind of mimic that. Um, when I was younger, we called that being like a poser. Yeah. Uh, kind of like, you know, I don't really like this music, but everyone else does. Um, so I guess like practicing that is is important. And that, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about with like the, being in, in a relationship. It's like if you find yourself morphing to that person – and I find I found my, myself doing this like whatever they wanted to watch is like I want to make them happy so we would watch it and and whatever. Yeah. I think that comes to setting boundaries as well of like I have to maintain my independence, um, which I I had like it's learning, right? Yeah, I, totally. I didn't have that. This was a first serious relationship, so I didn't have that experience to know that. I had to maintain my boundaries and, and my independence in a way because in my mind during that time, I was just kind of like, I love this person. I want to make them happy. But then I was, I was actually causing a negative by doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so going back to developing the baseline that you talked about, I'd love to hear some of your personal experiences because when I listen to these podcasts, I'm always interested in like, okay, what, what does that mean? So if I do this, what's actually going to happen? Um, so how does that show up in your life now? Um, when you're dealing with particularly stressful or emotional situations, um, how do you kind of, uh, be like Buddha in a sense? (laughs) Um, or what are some, maybe what are some experiences that, that you have now, or what are some realizations that you've made of like, oh, this used to impact me and now it really doesn't as much. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, so let me think. Um, well, uh, well, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit different for me. Um, because I, I, so I've been like a very, very calm and calming person for a long time. Right. Like that's sort of like the niche that like I filled out in my family. The calming person in the family? Yeah. (laughs) Um, And so part of my work has, has like, is to like learn to embrace like the more fiery part of myself. 
and and really like in the last few years I've just learned I mean I'm definitely still learning but like to fight well and to argue well and to enter into conflicts well right so um and and that's that's been one of my practices for the last couple of years and and I've I've done this um in sort of work contexts like with okay. leaders I'm working with where I where I'll just say I'm I'm drawing the line here and we need to enter into conflict together. And if we don't enter into conflict together, we're, we can't go anywhere else. So, um, so whereas in the past, I would have been really frustrated and, and just let it continue to happen. Mm. Now I'll say, no, this isn't okay. We need to enter into conflict and we need to like just have it out. We don't need to like fight and scream and yell and right. be disrespectful. But we need to actually heighten the difference enough so that we so that something can be liberated in our dynamic because it's not getting liberated and it's killing me. It's killing our life force and I don't want to deal with it anymore. The energetic drain is just not worth it. Right. So for me, it's been it's been more about picking up um, p- like picking up the ability to to heighten the difference and to and to differentiate and to say, no, I'm actually, I'm not okay with that. Um, it's a little counterintuitive in a sense. I mean, we talk about like, how do we increase our calm, but then you're kind of waking up in a sense to realize that sometimes to get to that place, there are, conflict is a requirement. Totally. In a sense. Oh my God. Like, And if, you see that in managing organizations, I'm sure oh in the work God. that you do. Like if people just actually <laughs> like had it out every once in a while yeah. at work, God, they would f- just actually free up so much energy and life force in themselves and, and the whole system. Like I just, tr- I believe that, which is like, I love working with conflict and I love facilitating conflict because if we learn how to be in conflict, again, mm. conflict is just heightened difference. If we learn how to sit in the discomfort of the difference long enough, right. then it liberates itself and it really does. And how do you do that um, when you when you're under the impression that that other person might not be receptive? Well, you just have to you just have to learn skillful means, you know. And you can't, you know. Well, I there's a couple different things from the point of view of a facilitator. Mm-hmm. Look, if if <laughs> like I just believe I believe so much in facilitation. It's one of my passions. Okay. So like you can see the energy, yeah, yeah, right? I'm... You can hear it. <laughs> um, like if, if people just had facilitators, Okay. if people had facilitators to have difficult conversations, like things would be way different. Um, so kind of define facilitators because I have an idea and maybe people listening have an idea about what do you mean by yeah, that? Yeah. Okay. So that's a great, that's a great point because, Okay. There's a, there's a difference between facilitation, like what I mean, mm-hmm. training, someone who's like putting on a training or someone who's giving a presentation, right? So when I talk about facilitation, I'm talking about, so the, the type of facilitation I'm trained in is integral facilitation. Um, and integral means, you know, to do like a really quick and dirty definition, it's like we are including as many perspectives as possible in the conversation and the style of facilitation that this is is it's called self as instrument so the training that i've gone through and the sort of facilitation that i practice and that i love and i think could like really help people is um is that i've I've trained my ability to attune to my own nervous system my own experience as it's emerging, Mm -hmm. as it's arising, Mm -hmm. and what's happening inside of a group. So very, very simply at the same time, right? So it's like what's happening in my system and what's happening in the group and how are they informing each other? How is this co-emergent and what needs to happen? So fundamentally, I'm following the energy in the conversation and I'm just there to service the moment. I, I, I work super emergently, Mm -hmm. so... Um, so just thinking about some facilitation I did last week, I worked with the team, it was a team of five and they, they had sort of three objectives. One was to have a conversation around strategy. 
one was to have a conversation around purpose and one was just to really go deeper as a team i'm not there to facilitate a strategic planning process right i am not there to facilitate a purpose conversation i am there to support them in having a better conversation so it's super emergent it's not there's no agenda by looking at like very very subtle cues that you're trained yeah. to to basically look at yeah um it's interesting you you talk about this and it's kind of analogous to I have this very big interest in jujitsu. Oh yeah. Um, like conflict is necessary. And then one of the, one of the strange things about jujitsu and like UFC, if you've ever watched fighting, you see these two individuals trying to kill each other and destroy each other for five rounds in a fight or in jujitsu, you're trying to choke the person out. <laughs> and then once that is over, Hey man, like you hug each other out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's so weird. Um, it's it's a little bit more difficult probably in like a corporate setting but sometimes if you can get that conflict out and get that agitation out which is a, a very natural human behavior in a healthy way um there is this release yeah something gets liberated yeah literally yeah there's a release yeah. and there's a deeper connection there's a deepening and and that's, I mean, that's, I think that's what a lot of people want at some level, but they don't know and they don't know how to get there. And, 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 you know, we're super dangerous. We're humans are super dangerous to each other. Mm -hmm. And we, we can be super dangerous in so many ways. And the ability to just sit in the discomfort and be held in the discomfort by a skilled facilitator, it just, it can mean the world. It can mean so much can shift in such a short amount of time mm -hmm. if, if you just go about it skillfully. Um, so that's, so a big part of your training is then essentially sitting in the, in the discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, and is that, is there a, does that start with the body? Um, or does that kind of start with what's going on internally in your, in your thoughts? For me personally? Yeah. yeah. Well, sort of everything starts with the body. I mean, that's yeah. not true. I mean, <laughs> What should I say? Well, so I've, I've been training my mind-body awareness. Um, I was a dancer, but really I started formally training my mind-body awareness in 2005, um, which is great for me because I'm a heady intellectual type and to really have, have been able to find this deep connection in the body which is something I'm constantly working towards. Like I'm always trying to deepen it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's sort of a miracle for me that like that happened when I was in college that I like found this, I found mind body awareness work. Um, and I can just say a little more specifically, like the modalities I've trained in are, uh, we did like kinetic awareness, Feldenkrais, Alexander technique, things like that, walking meditation. Um, so finding that in 2005 and, and that continuing to be such a huge part of my practice, embodiment, working with the body, um, there's just so much information. There's so much information in the body. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can just relax into the experience, the more knowledge we have about ourselves and what we're actually experiencing. So, okay, so you're asking a more specific question about um, those moments. Well... Yeah, I mean, ideally, and for the most part, these facilitation experiences, they're like a flow state. So I might be like... For you? For, for me, okay. for me. Um, I definitely don't know how they are for other people. I mean, I have a sense, you know, because I yeah. talk to them and, um, and I guide them and I, you know, I get feedback and I, I have a sense. Um, I'm being a little flippant there. Uh, so for me, it's, it is like a flow state. And like I said, like I, like my goal is to service the moment and to service the moment means I really, I have got to get out of the way. You know, I'm, I'm trying to let something unfold. I'm trying to, um, I'm just trying to support an unfolding that, that wants to happen and it has nothing to do with me. 
you're removing your ego in a sense as well. Yeah. Well, and that's why you got into the flow state a little bit. Yeah. yeah it's uh, it's kind of a it's a similar thing with with jujitsu. It's a similar thing with yoga. Um, with so many practices, even a good conversation, you are forced into the present because your attention is necessary to that present moment. When you're listening to a, a YouTube video, it's kind of like I can change another screen and whatever. But when you're um, present moment awareness is required to survive to work whatever it becomes easier to find that flow state yeah totally yeah okay and, yeah no go and ahead, I go would, ahead and i would just say like and and sort of that's what happens in conflict right As we're so we're so perceptive our humanity is so perceptive right and as soon as conflict arises it's like all these little antenna are like whoo conflict right and then the next move often is to collapse the conflict, to end it, sure. right? To create sameness again super quick. But if we can just let our little antenna like just relax into the conflict a little bit, like there's so much more can happen. I'm just repeating myself, but it's it matters. Well, it's it's important and I I I think to myself like how can I cultivate how can I cultivate that and and how can I do that when I when I feel a disagreement arising how can i enter into that conflict in a healthy way respecting the other person's opinion because when when your ego is not involved when your ego is involved it becomes more difficult to do that i think about kind of like arguments i had in in my past relationship and like there were clear things that that she was telling me but because i felt like i wasn't her, being heard yeah Instead of listening, I was screaming louder. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so even you know, just like that, like you just said, like this, the power of feeling heard, right? And so, just the refinement around the pacing of a conversation, like slow down, right? The pacing of a conversation, and that refinement of, of, of taking turns, sort of, and saying and saying whatever you need to say. And then it being received, maybe it being played back to you. This is some of the work, you know, this, I do this with teams. Right. And then, and then actually did like, did I feel heard? Like the refinement of, of, of coming back to yourself and saying, wait, do I like, did that actually land? Like, do I feel like I was heard and really like sort of just pacing with yourself instead of like just running ahead, which is what can happen in conflict. Right. Um, it's a practice. It's a practice. I mean, it's it's all a practice, right? Yeah. Uh, cool. I know we're we're about a we're about an hour now. I could go in in so many directions and and talk to you all day. I think like maybe for the for the last couple minutes, um, I ju I, I want to kind of mention something a little bit more a more deep cut. And I'm just I want I, I'm interested in your in your thoughts on this. Um, I have somebody pretty close to me that that's been suffering from an eating disorder yeah. uh, for like a long time um, and hasn't been able to shake it. Um, th th this is, is something that I think that maybe like mind body awareness can help with. Um, have you experienced anybody that's gone through something like that? And have you kind of been able to talk through that in, in any way? Um, yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear about that. It's, it's, um, I mean, for me, especially because I, I have this deep interest in embodiment and, um, ah, oh, so many people, especially women in, you know, have food issues with food. Yeah. Um, I'm super fortunate. Whatever my parents did, I've never had issues with food, but I've always been sort of fascinated by eating disorders um, because it, this it's like this drive to erase yourself in a way. I don't know. I'm generalizing. Anyway, um, I definitely have worked with people who, and have been close to people who have addiction. Right. It's an addiction. And... Um, and, you know, it's the thing about addiction is that, uh, you know, what what the experts say about addiction is that no matter what, it's it's always with you your whole life. It's going to be there in some way. And 
and you know it's it's the um like in developmental psychology the way that development is talked about it's talked about the difference between subject object relationships so it's like what's what is like what are you subject to mm -hmm. like what's just sort of like what's just like happening in yourself and in your body and your system that like you sort of don't have control over and then throughout your life things come into awareness like like it shifts from being a subject like you're being subject right to an object in your awareness and you're like oh that thing i'm doing right right and and probably we can all relate to some extent of that shift so i don't know it's not an answer right but it's it's sort of like that's what's coming up in my awareness is like what is object and what is subject and like the the work that can be done to heal attachment to heal sort of relational uh disturbances or challenges and and then um and then the awareness that can be grown around uh, around those those behaviors, those those activities um, that are that are like the addictive behaviors. You know, I think um, when anyone is suffering, you know, in this way, and and you know, we're all, we're all touched by suffering, you know, whether it be addiction or it be cancer or it be estranged family me members, like, you know, divorce. Sure. Um, the more that we can invite and call our own humanity into the picture to be supportive, to be compassionate, to develop our own loving kindness, the better. Um, you know, and if, and if there's someone that, that's in your life that you're really concerned about, um, expressing that concern in a way that that is deeply compassionate is, you know, sort of a first step. Absolutely. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because, again, we talk about getting, I talked about getting interested in meditation just through, like, increased focus, but the the truth and what i've realized is that it's kind of come down to me trying to find compassion first for myself which is yeah. is um actually not selfish totally it's kind of selfless in a way to find compassion for yourself and then that kind of seeps to to others as well um i Wait, like I just, can i just go i just want to repeat that because you i think you said something really profound and important there that to have and develop self-compassion, it is not selfish. In many ways, it is selfless. That That is just so true, and I think a lot of people need to hear that. Cool. Um, last question. Uh, if you could go on a road trip with anybody alive or dead, <laughs> who would you go with and where would you go? Uh, <laughs> um, a road, okay. Only one person or multiple people? Have at it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. okay. Um, so I would probably choose, well, this is sort of like, it feels like a cop out because I would choose like my teach by Buddhist teacher who I just don't get to spend a lot of time with. Okay. Um, I would choose uh, my mentor, Rob McNamara, because he's amazing and I also want to spend more time with him right now. Um, and then I would choose like Tilda Swinton, <laughs> Tilda Swinton, because she I just think she's amazing, um, and she's sort of like my my like fashion icon, uh, and I don't know it's it's I would I would probably I mean is it it also feels like a cop out to say like. Like the first Buddha. Yeah, you can... Like, let's just go there. Let's go there. <laughs> so where are you guys going? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I think we're like... I think it's like the... America. Like, I would road trip throughout our country because I think sort of that's what's needed. And like, God, our country is beautiful and I have it not so seen beautiful. it. And I just want to like see it. And, and, you know, I just, you know, whatever, like, craziness we could get up to, 
I think it's what the West needs. That's a good place to end. Um, Dr. Blumenthal, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Cool. Yeah. <laughs>